Good morning. Welcome to our worship service. Can you believe it's December? Wow, it feels like it, doesn't it? Glad that you're all with us today. We have a great, great day planned for you. I'm excited about the service. We got a little get together after the service, some food, hanging up some Christmas decorations, things like that. Love to have you stick around for that as well. If you would, why don't you, uh, you know, you're going to be seated. Actually, we're going to do something a little different today. But today we're starting our Advent series. And if you're new to the church, you might not know what Advent is. It basically, the word means coming. And we're celebrating the coming of Jesus to earth. And we'll be doing that the next three to four weeks, celebrating the birth of Jesus and all that he's done for us. And we're going to discover today how God has a way of showing up and giving us grace in unlikely places. So I'm excited. We have Tyler and Kylie with us today. They're going to come light our Advent candle today, share a little bit of a testimony with us, their glory story in Jesus, and then we will do some singing together. Okay, um, well, me and Kylie, Kylie kind of grew up in a, kind of a Catholic home. She's been around having faith and religion, not me, though. Um, but since coming here and having faith in God and Jesus, it has given us faith in something just beyond us. So if there's a problem we can't control, pray on it and move and kind of hand it over and it kind of relieves the uh, relieves the stress that we have on our shoulders so um yeah just that's about all i got he said basically what i was going to say <laughs> will you stand with us to worship this morning Desire of nations, my 
feel free to do that. Father, we come to you at this time and we thank you for your presence that we've sent here in this service. God, we thank you for the words of the songs that we've sung. We believe they're true. We believe that when we put our anchor in you, the storms will blow, but we'll be firm in you. We believe that you will never let us down. You've been faithful and true for so many years and through so many situations. We ask that those who are going through difficult times right now, that 
your spirit would minister to them, be counselor, be comforter to them. Lord, there are probably people watching right now. There are so, so many people who are sick right now in our congregation. Colds and flus, COVID has reared its head again a little bit. Those who are suffering from cancer and uh, different issues like that. Lord, we ask you to be their healer. We ask you to be their strength, be their provider. God, there are people just facing financial difficulties. I'm sure as in the sound of my voice right now, May they know you as the one who will provide for all of their needs according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. There are those among us who need emotional healing today. We pray, Father, that you would minister to the emotions, the spirit of men, women, boys, and girls here today, that they would know and feel the unconditional love and grace of Jesus today. And we pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, Deb, come on up. Deb has a quick, couple quick announcements for us. Good morning. A um, couple real quick announcements. Um, as the preacher alluded to earlier, we do have hanging of the greens. Um, I will feed you if you'll stay and help us. Um, second announcement is... Um, we have the privilege um, of adopting a few families this year through Bright Futures. Um, there were 53 families and there were 60 of us organizations that volunteered. So what I have set us up to do is actually do stockings this year. So we have 18 stockings. Next week it'll be out there. Um, shampoos, pajamas, things of that nature. We have the opportunity to bless 18 kids. Um, we also have the opportunity, they're going to come and actually pick up stuff through here. So if you're interested in helping me, please let me know. Um, definitely appreciate it. If you don't want to shop and you want to put money in the, in the offering plate, I will shop for you. So I love to shop, so that's all right. So if you want to do that, just earmark it toward that. My third announcement is we need to sing happy birthday. So if we, um, are we going to do the whoop doo Okay, we're going to do the whoop doo All right. Today is Kim Dewey's birthday, so uh, you're welcome. Um, the board and your church would like to say thank you. Go ahead. Happy birthday, happy birthday, whoop-dee-doo, whoop-dee-doo. Happy, happy birthday, happy, happy birthday. We love you, we love you. We only embarrass you like that of your staff, so don't worry. <laughs> We are so glad that you are part of our church family. Thank you for your faithfulness giving. Guys, come on forward. We're going to take up our offering today. We have a part of a service as we do offering. I'm going to have you ask you just to kind of keep your eyes glued up here. We have some people doing cardboard testimonies. I don't know if you've ever seen those before, but it'll be pretty uh, self-explanatory when you see it. It'll be happening during offering as they take up the offering. God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us as we've just sung about. Now, part of the proper response to your faithfulness to us is that we're faithful in return. And now we give back what you've given to us so it can be used to help other people. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you as you give at this time. I am forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted
stain the sin which made communion with God impossible. This death, this stench sent from the depths would no longer be left to permeate the hearts of man. The creator is longing for his creation. This day love made a way for grace to take away, erase, replace our brokenness. For God so loved the world, he sent his only son, the promised one had come to change our eternity.
of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David and the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Enadad, and Amadad the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed by the father of Jesse. Jesse, the father of David the king, and David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joraham, and Joraham the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh. And Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and Jeconiah's brothers, at the time of the dispersion to Babylon. And after the dispersion to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheatiel, and Sheatiel, the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel, the father of Abu, and Abu, the father of Elakiah, and Elakiah, the father of Azor, and Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim, and Achim, the father of Eliu, Eliu, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, and the husband of Mary, who Jesus Christ was born, and who was called Christ. So of all the generations from Abraham and David, there were 14 generations from David to the dispersion to Babylon. That was a pretty good job, wasn't it? I had him do that so I wouldn't have to. Got a little smarter in my old age. All right, kids, you can go back to the back. Miss Rochelle has volunteered to jump in last minute to help us. Let's pray before we go into the message. Father, thank you for this day, for faithfulness in our lives. Pray that as we hear your word now, you'd apply it to us and help us to become just like Jesus name of Jesus we pray. Amen. A recent Christmas gift that a lot of people have been buying in recent years has been subscriptions to genealogy services, kind of like Ancestry.com. That's my probably my one and only gift recommendation for you this year, so you might want to write it down. A uh, little expensive, and I found out that it's a $5 billion industry in America. They're projecting 11% growth by 2028. So a lot of people are interested in finding out where they came from. We're all interested in our roots, I guess. And kind of like the song says, zipping up my boots, getting back to my roots, to the place of my birth, back down to earth. Ain't talking about the roots of the land, talking about the roots of the man. I feel my spirit's getting old. It's time to recharge my soul. I'm zipping up my boots, getting back to my roots, to the place of my birth. I think we have a hunger to know where we came from. It's interesting in the society that we live in, we have more ways to quote unquote connect with people, don't we, than ever before. But so many people feel disconnected. Isn't that ironic? That with all these forms of connection, so many people feel disconnected from each other. There's a, there's a sense of rootlessness. And as great as these things are, and I, I, you know, look, I, I'm not against smartphones, I use them, and uh, there, there's some good benefits to the different things that we have and different things that we use. But it's like the girl that I heard about. She's a young girl. She was scared in her room, and she was asking for her daddy to come in, and he was tired, didn't want to come in. Finally, he gave up and came in, and he was talking to her. He said, honey, you know, Jesus is with you all the time, and if you get scared, he can be with you. You can pray to him, and he'll help you not be scared. And she said, yeah, but daddy, sometimes I need somebody with skin on. <laughs> Isn't that true? From the mouths of babes. Sometimes we just need somebody with skin on, don't we? We need somebody who can listen to us. You know, people pay $150 an hour just for somebody to listen to them today. We call them counselors. That's a lot of what they do. We're hungry for somebody just to connect with a sense of rootedness. We've lost a lot of that in our society today. And 
Miles just read the genealogy of Jesus, going all the way back to Abraham. Not all the names are in there. I don't have time to get into all that piece of it. But the Israelite people place a heavy emphasis on genealogies and where they came from. For one, in that day, the oldest son got the inheritance. So it was important to know who that was. If you were the oldest son, you were very interested in that. A land allotments were based on that organizing censuses, things like that. And if you happen to be in the family of royalty, this was a huge deal. Just like over in Britain, they got to go through all this stuff to decide who's the prince, who's the next king and queen, all this stuff. It was all based on this genealogy. And Matthew wrote the book of, he wrote this book, the spiritual biography of Jesus, to convince and uh, show the people of Israel that Jesus really is the Messiah. And it says in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And there's some important pieces right there. First of all, it says that Jesus is the Messiah. There were all sorts of prophecies in the Old Testament related to who the Messiah would be. And it was prophesied thousands of years before Jesus was born that the Messiah would come from, first of all, the line of Abraham. It says in Genesis 12, 3, God said to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. And then in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12, David was the greatest king of Israel, and the Abraham and David were kind of like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln to the Israelite people. They, they were the, the key leaders who formed the nation. It says in 2 Samuel 7, 12, God says this to David, when your days are over, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. And it says in verse 13, his kingdom, the throne of his kingdom will last forever and ever. You realize just in being born the way he was, Jesus fulfilled 2,000 years of prophecy. I mean, this is written 2,000 years in advance that he fulfilled prophecies that said he would be the son of David, an eternal king who would bless all the nations of the earth. And of course, Jesus has done that through his death, his burial, his crucifixion, resurrection from the dead, the forgiveness of sins, a new nature, a new heredity, a new future. I call that a Christmas miracle. What about you? 2,000 years in advance. I mean, if you don't believe in Jesus, I just encourage you to do a Google search on prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. 66 of them written in the Old Testament about who the Messiah would be, and Jesus fulfilled every one of them. And the first thing I want us to see about his uh, genealogy is, first of all, Jesus had a messianic heredity. We just talked about that. He came from the line of David and Abraham. Secondly, he had a divine heredity. Now, is it okay if I get a little geeky right now? I, I gotta be a little bit of a nerd now. You know, when I was in college, they, in my sophomore year, I'm 19 years old, and I had an 8 a.m. class. Is that fair? Is it fair to give a 19-year-old college student an 8 a.m. class? And you know what my class was? New Testament Greek. Isn't that just what you want to get up in the morning and go do? 8 a.m., four days a week, New Testament Greek. So I got to use it every once in a while, okay? I went through five semesters of this. And it says in verse 16, Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, was, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. One of the central tenets, central facts of the Christian faith is the virgin conception and virgin birth of Jesus. In fact, Isaiah 7, 14, 700 years before Jesus was born, prophesied that the Messiah would be born of a virgin. Not a young woman, she was a young woman, but some like to say, oh, she was just a young woman who was married. A virgin is what, was what that word means. Somebody who has never had sexual intercourse is going to be the one who gives birth to the Messiah. Some have tried to write this off. They seem like it's too big of a miracle. How could that really happen? And they try to explain it away and come up with all these different explanations. But let me tell you, without the virgin of birth of Jesus, we have no Savior. Absolutely not. He had to be God so that he could uh, have, live a perfect life, and he had to be man so that he could die. 
He had to become a man to die, and he had to be God for the death to matter. Because if a man dies for me, it doesn't do me any good long, doesn't do me any good beyond the grave. It might give me a few more years on earth. But Jesus had to live a perfect life, and only God can do that for the sacrifice to matter. He had to live that kind of life. He was born of a virgin. And verse 16, Matthew's choosing his words very closely. This is, and the New, Test, the New Testament was written in Greek, and uh, just from some study, I was reminded of some things this week. First of all, it says Mary was the mother of Jesus. In the, the Old Testament times and New Testament times, the genealogies never, say never, never pointed to the woman. That, that's just the way the world was. And I'm not saying it was good. I'm just, that's just, so, so for Mary to even be in here is radical. Just, just to be mentioned in here is, is something that was never done. The, so it says, Mary was the mother of Jesus. Miles did a great job reading these passages. It says, Abraham was the father of Isaac in verse 2. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah. If you've got the King James Version, anybody got the King James Version with you today? How many of you remember what it says? Abraham begat, Isaac begat, Jacob begat, and all these begats, right? Just all the way down through. There are 17 verses of begats. Here's what's very amazing to me. Forty times those begats are used. And what that is, and this is where the Greek comes in, there's two tenses in Greek. There's past tense and there's present tense. Or, or there, I'm sorry, voices. Passive voice and active voice. Active voice is when the subject acts and does something. Abraham begat, Isaac begat, just right down the line. Forty times active voice is used. One time in this whole genealogy, the passive voice is used. And it's there where it says, Jesus, Mary, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. The, and then it goes into verse 17 to um, lay out all the different aspects of this. And Jesus was born to Mary. Was born is the key phrase there. Jesus was born. That phrase is in the passive tense, and we call it the divine passive. What that means is, is rather than Mary instigating the action, the action was instigated by someone else, and it was instigated by God. It's called the divine passive. God is acting on another person. And the way he acted in this situation was he impregnated Mary in a supernatural way through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. He impregnated Mary in a supernatural way. This was not, you know, the mythologies talk about gods having sex with humans. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that the Holy Spirit empowered, overshadowed Mary, and miraculously an embryo was formed in her life, it became a fetus, it, and eventually was born, and that baby is Jesus the Messiah. Some people say, how does that happen? Well, I would say to you, how does any miracle happen? That's why they're miracles. <laughs> they're impossible. There's all sorts of miracles in the Bible that are attested to where older women who are beyond childbearing years have babies. God is a miracle-working God. Do you need a Christmas miracle this year? I want to encourage you to be thinking about a miracle that you need as we go through this series. I want you to write it down. In fact, on December 24th and 25th in those services, you're going to bring those miracles that you need to God, and we're going to present them to God, and we're going to ask God to do some miracles that we need in our lives. And the last point here is it says that Joseph was the husband of Mary. That's very interesting. It doesn't say Joseph was the father of Jesus. It says Joseph was the husband of Mary. Why would it say that? Because Joseph wasn't the father, biologically speaking. He was the adoptive father. He took Jesus in. I have a nephew who took in a child that was not his, raised it just like it was his own. That's what Joseph did in very adverse circumstances, and we'll talk about that more next week. And then our new heredity leads to a new destiny. Genesis 1-1 and Matthew 1-1 sound an awful lot alike. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, the word is Genesis, 
And then the, it says in Matthew 1, 1, this is the genealogy of Jesus. These are the same words, genealogy and Genesis. In the beginning of the New Testament, just like in the beginning of the Old Testament, the word for created is used, the beginning, the genealogy, the Genesis. And just like God created the heavens and the earth in the Old Testament, at the beginning of the New Testament, at just the right time, at the beginning of the New Age, a new child is born who would give everybody, who would be a new creation and give all of us the opportunity to become a new creation in Jesus, to know Jesus, to live with Jesus, and to live with him for eternity in the new Jerusalem. A brand new creation came into existence in Matthew 1, just like it did in Genesis 1. Through faith in Jesus, we can be a part of that new creation. Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. And he had some interesting grandpas. In fact, we just had a listing of all those grandpas. I heard a about a very prominent family, they commissioned a biographer to do a family tree for their family. They were very concerned, though, because they had an Uncle George in their family tree. Anybody got an Uncle George in your family tree? You know what I'm talking about. Uncle George had some issues. In fact, this Uncle George had some real issues. He had gotten drunk, killed a person, went to prison, and was executed in the electric chair. So the family is very concerned, you know, what are they going to do about Uncle George when they get there? Because they know they're going to find out about Uncle George. So they told the biographer, would you please be very careful how you handle the description about Uncle George? He assured them he could handle it. Is it okay if I just read it to you? Anybody want to hear what it says? Uncle George occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. He was attached to the position by the strongest of ties. It gets even better. And his death came as a real shock. I'll let you verify whether or not that's true. <laughs> I really don't know. I, I read it myself this week. He had all sorts of interesting grandpas. I want to talk about the grandpas. And we learned some lessons about who God uses by reading through this list. First of all, God uses the faithful. Thank you for being faithful. God honors it. He will use you. Talks about Abraham, by faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered his Isaac as a sacrifice. God didn't actually have him go through with it. He was testing him to see if anyone was more important to him than himself. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. Jacob, it says in Hebrews eleven twenty one, by faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and worshipped. He leaned on it. Even as he's dying, he was worshiping God as he went out of the world. Ruth, what a wonderful woman. Her husband died. Her, she had no, at, no kind of requirement that she should have to stay with her mother-in-law because now that her husband was dead she was free from any connections any requirements that she would have had to take care of her mother-in-law but rather than leave her mother-in-law all by herself Ruth said to her where you go I will go and where you stay I will stay your people will be my people and your God my God that's faithfulness Solomon was a great king of Israel David was a man after God's heart these are names listed here Asa, it says in 1 Kings 15, 11, Asa did what was right in the Lord as his father David had done. Josiah says, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart. Hezekiah is another king of Israel, another grandfather of Jesus. It says, trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. They were faithful to God in their generation. And it matters that you're faithful to God. Please know that it matters. It matters to me. It matters to God. You know, it's interesting, though. These faithful people, even they had their issues. I mean, Abraham, before he came, knew God, was an idolater. And even after he started following God, had a, had a real problem with telling fibs. I mean, I'm talk, we're, we're talking real fibs. He was a fibber. And Jacob, he stole his brother's birthright and blessing. 
when he was born, the Bible says he was, he was a twin. He was grabbing his brother's heel. He wanted to be first <laughs> as he came out. They gave him the name Jacob because it means heel grabber. His very name meant cheater. But he was faithful in the end of his life. David, the man after God's own heart, most of us know that story, had an affair. Then he had to cover it up and sent the woman's wife, a husband, out into battle and put him in a position where he'd be sure to get killed so that he could just pretend like he was killed and then he found her after the guy was dead. It was, you know, the scandal and a cover-up. It just goes right down the list. All these people had some of their baggage. It just goes to remind us that even those of us who are faithful have flaws. And God can use us anyway, despite our flaws. Second thing I find in this list is God uses failures. I read this week that families are like fudge. Mostly, mostly sweet with a few nuts. And that's true, isn't it? Let me give you some of the names here. Judah that is listed. Let me just say, Judah was not the kind of guy dads that you want your father to go out with. I'm going to let you read the story. He's, he was a bad dude. And it's, it, it's interesting that Judah was not the oldest son of Jacob. Remember I told you that the oldest sons got the inheritance, became the leader? I don't know if he became, got the inheritance or not, but rather than listing the oldest son as the leader of the family, Judah is listed as the leader of the family. And Jesus comes out of the line of Judah rather than the line of Reuben, who was the oldest son. And Judah, I mean, he did things I'm not even going to talk about in front of mixed company. Now, at the end of his life, he got things worked out, thankfully. But there was no earthly reason to bless Judah like that. Now, don't feel too sorry for Reuben. He wasn't any better, okay? I'm not trying to say we should feel sorry for Reuben, but God uses failures. Rahab. How many of you know what Rahab did? I, you know, I'll let you study that on your own. Do your own Google search of Rahab. You'll find out what her job was. But she saved the two spies of uh, Israel that went into Jericho to spy out the land before Israel went in. And she ends up in the family line of Jesus despite her checkered past. To say the least, Hebrews 11.31 says, By faith Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Then there's a lady named Bathsheba. If you look for Bathsheba's name in the list, you won't find it because it's not there. It simply says Uriah's wife. That's Bathsheba. Remember I just told you a story about a woman that David had an affair with. Well, that was Bathsheba. Now, in the Me Too craze of the world that we live in today, some people are trying to say that David probably raped Bathsheba. I don't think so, because in this passage, spirit inspired by God, they don't even list Bathsheba's name. It doesn't even make it in there. But Bathsheba is used by God to give birth to Solomon, and Solomon's in this list, and she turned her life around, we believe, as well. But are you starting to get the idea that God can use failures? God can use people who've blown it. You may feel like you've blown it too bad. God couldn't possibly use me. Well, I, just, just take a look at this list of names. He'll use you. All you've got to do is turn your life over to him. Manasseh is another guy. It says in 2 Kings 21.9, Manasseh had led Israel astray, so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. He was the worst king in the history of Israel. He actually commissioned that little children would be burned as sacrifices to idols. And yet at the end of his life, Nasa comes to God, surrenders his life to him. This guy's in the family line of Jesus. Are you getting the picture? You may feel like God couldn't possibly use you. Well, by the miracle of God's grace, there is absolutely no one that God cannot use. He can use you by grace. Then, there's a lot of forgotten people. 
Have you heard of these folks? Jeconiah, the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father. And it just, it just keeps going. Most of those names we know absolutely nothing about. Hezron, Ram. I mean, Ram had a truck named after him, but, you know, <laughs> where, where, where are these names coming from? We don't know these people. Abiud, Azor, I have no idea if I'm even saying them right. Akim, Zadok. They, they, they don't make the headlines in the Bible. But it means a lot to me to hear that even the forgotten are remembered by God. The, many of these names, we don't know them, but God knows them. Many of them are written down in the book of life. Do you ever wonder if God even notices you? Do you ever feel completely alone and disconnected like we talked about at the beginning of the message? Why would God be interested in me? He knows you by name. Christian, can I just say to you, your faithfulness really does matter. You're not famous, and you're not, none of us in here are going to be famous. But God knows us by name. Our faithfulness matters to him. In fact, it says in Psalms, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. When you're home alone and feel all alone, if you got Jesus, you're never alone. I know sometimes we need people with skin on. I get it, and I, I said that at the beginning of the, of the time. But I, I, I'm so grateful. Do you ever wake up in the middle of the night and you can't sleep? Anybody ever do that? Am I the only one? You know what I do in the middle of the night? I pray. I start talking to God. He's there. I'm never alone. That's what Emmanuel is all about, God with us. That's what the name means. He really is always with us. Then God honors five, wisdom, five women. Again, I'm not saying this is good. I'm just telling you the facts, ladies. Don't throw stones at me. Women never made genealogies. It always went back to the male. Five women make Jesus' genealogy. Isn't that interesting? Jesus did a lot to empower the discouraged, the disenfranchised, the devalued, the dissed people of life. And women, they were, they were way down the social totem pole in ancient Israel and the ancient world. They had no rights. They were totally at the mercy of their husbands. And Jesus lifts them up. And again, some of these are great ladies and some of these are guys that you don't want your son dating, Mom. I mean, just you go back and do a search on these names, and it, it's not pretty, some of them. I mean, it, it, this is the good, the bad, and the ugly listed right here in this genealogy. And then you got Mary. Guys, aren't we thankful for Mary? I've said it before, but I'm so glad when it came time to save the world, God got a woman involved. Aren't you? Mary. Who is more blessed in the history of the world than Mary, the human mother of God. To this day, songs are sung about her. We don't worship her. She's not God. We don't pray to her. But boy, we sure can respect her. We sure can honor her. Jesus lifted up the oppressed and the ostracized of society. And as I read this passage, I am reminded that God just has a way of showing up in the most unlikely places. I know it more than just because of this passage. I know it because he showed up in my life. And there's nobody more unlikely than me as far as I'm concerned. What do we do with this? I want to encourage you today to embrace your new DNA. God wants all of us in the family. He wants us all in the family. It says in John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or of a husband's will, but born of God. Jesus, the Son of God, became a man to make men and women sons and daughters of God. And all we have to do, I want you to hear me here, okay? This is so important. 
because so many people they think before I got before I come to God I got to get some things worked out clean some things up I know he'll forgive me but I got to get some things right first but you're never gonna get it right you're never gonna be good enough if you could be good enough why would you need forgiveness it begins with humbling ourselves and admitting that we can do nothing to save ourselves and asking God to forgive us. He became a baby. It's Christmas. Just take time to think about it. God became a baby. I was watching, Marcy and I were at Branson. We left last night at 6, got back, but we were watching a show and they were showing pictures of a little baby. And I was trying to, again, wrap my brain around how does God become a baby? It's a miracle of grace. Grace in a manger. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sin. It's the only means of forgiveness. The only way we can be right with God. Jesus died for us. If this, if this Bible represented every sin I've ever committed, that's this hand, Jesus is this hand, on the cross, God put my sins on Jesus. It's the only way it can happen that I can have a relationship with God. Believe plus receive equals become. It's more than just mental assent. It's more than just checking off the right boxes mentally. When you really put your faith in Jesus, you become a new person, a new creation. Old Steve, new Steve, right? I can't make that happen myself. It's a divine miracle of grace. God does it because he loves us. You can become a grand, brand new Christian. Hey, you can get designer jeans this year for Christmas. A whole new heredity. A whole new spiritual genetic makeup simply through faith in Jesus. The last thing I'd like to encourage you to do today is to leave your past in the past. I'm so glad that everything I've done wrong wasn't written in this book. But God included these stories for us. To say, you know what? we're all flawed. We've all sinned. We've all made mistakes. Leave it in the past. Don't go back to it. Stay focused on Jesus. Stay focused on his cross, his death for you. Leave your past in the past. The miracle of grace can give you a place in God's family and repurpose your regrets for the purpose that he has for your life. Let's read that together. The miracle of grace can give you a place in God's family and repurpose your regrets for the purpose he has for you. Is that good news? You come just as you are, but you don't have to leave as you are. It, it doesn't matter what your family background is. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter how bad you think you've blown it, how far you think you are from God. God will take every one of your regrets if you let him and find a way to repurpose those regrets into a brand new plan and a brand new purpose for your life. That's grace. It's a miracle of grace. It's the most important miracle that we need. We pray for people to be healed of physical illnesses, but we all know at some point we're going to die. We're going to leave this world. The most important miracle is the miracle that changes me into a son of God or a daughter of God so that when I die, I can live with eternity for, with Jesus in heaven. I love it as I close now. Most genealogies begin with the person oldest and works up to the person that they want to highlight. If you read this, you'll, you'll see at the beginning, Jesus' name is listed. And at the end, Jesus' name is listed. That never happened either. I think it's appropriate, though, isn't it? 
he's the first and the last, the Alpha, the Omega, the A and the Z, Lord of everything in between. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He is the Savior of his family line, and he is the Savior of the whole family tree. He is the Savior of his family line. He's the Savior of my family line. He's not just supporting cast. He's the star of the show. He's the Savior of the world, and he is your Savior. And that is what Christmas is all about. Would you please bow your head with me right now there at your seat? This Christmas season, I want to give you the opportunity to receive the greatest gift ever, the gift of a brand new start. You can become a brand new creation right here today. You can get a brand new start. If you're a Christian and you're going through a difficult time and you're wondering where God is, I may know it may not feel like it, but I want you to know never alone when you have Jesus. When you're at home alone and feel all alone, Jesus is just a prayer away. If you're not a Christian yet, I want to give you the opportunity to right now to pray a prayer. The words are not magical. It's simply an opportunity for you to express to God that you want to ask Him to forgive you of your sins give you a new start, make you a brand new creation, and to give you the hope of eternal life. Just, just pray this with me right there at your seat if you're ready to do that. Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. He came to earth for that purpose. He was born as a baby. He lived a perfect life. I just say this to him. I, I believe opened my eyes to show me. Now I put my faith in the death of Jesus. I believe that he rose again. And Father, right now I invite Jesus to come into my life. To not only be my Savior, but to be my Lord and my leader. Please forgive me. Make me a new creation. And help me to live my life prayed that prayer, would you just raise your hand right now if you see? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Christian, two words of encouragement. Leave your past in your past. It does no good to go back to it. It does have no earthly good to go back to it. A lot of people see would just say, it does you no good. say to God, God, right now, I want to leave my past and my past by your grace, and I ask you to repurpose my regrets for the purpose that you have for me. I trust you to do it. And for the brokenhearted, for the one that's feeling alone today, why don't you just say to Jesus, Jesus, I feel alone. I feel like nobody cares my head, I believe that you care, but in my heart, I'm having a hard time. I pray right now that you would give me a sign of your presence, a sense of your presence, give me hope for the future, and I commit to rely and lean on you no matter what comes in the future. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Are you ready for a Christmas miracle? Write them down. One heart, one home, one community for Christ. Thank you for coming. If you can stay and help us with decorations, we'd love it. I need some men who can go 